today I wanted to talk to you about your experience with the apprenticeship program and some of the impacts that it had on you and some of the impacts that you've been able to have on, on the community and, and um, software development industry at large um, since then. Um, so yeah. I guess I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you because we've spent a lot of time in the past together. Um, I feel like I know you a lot, uh, but <laughs> I wanted to give you a chance to tell your story about apprenticeship because I know a lot about it and it's really impactful to me and I know that it will be for, for other people. Um, so welcome and, and thank you for, for taking some time to, uh, to go through this, uh, this interview with me. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, it's always, always a joy to talk to you too, Tim. It's always fun. Um, and uh, yeah, this is actually like, it's, it's funny because I don't think that I've really ever, you know, sat down and, and kind of went back from the very beginning, right? When I found the apprenticeship program and like told the story all the way through, right? Going through like signing up for the apprenticeship program, taking the tests, you know, doing the interviews. And I have a funny story about the interview too, because I was in Japan, right? When I found out about the apprenticeship program, yeah. I found Gaslight on online because I was doing some work with Elixir. And at the time, Angular 2 had, had not even been like, this was Angular 2 days, like before it was even Angular 2. It was like Angular 2 beta something or whatever. I remember those days. I actually don't know any of the, the, the future days of Angular since then. So this yeah, is the no, only neither. experience that was I like have with last, Angular. <laughs> that was completely like the last time I touched it was, was back. This is probably... Oh, I don't even know, 20, mid 2016, I guess, is when I was doing this. But uh, so Chris Nelson, he had a, he had like a full website and a blog post about how he hooked up a, a, a Phoenix backend with uh, an Angular front end, right? And how you package those two things together so that you could serve, you know, your Phoenix app and then your Phoenix app can serve the, the bundle of like Angular mm -hmm. two assets together. And I had no idea what I was doing. So I was looking on the internet for like how you would do that um, just on this little side project I was working on. And then that's how I came across Gaslight. And then I noticed at the very bottom of the screen as you scroll down, it says like, you're based in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I was like, that's, that's my hometown, this is crazy. <laughs> And then I looked through the website further and then I found that y'all did apprenticeship program. And I was like, wow, this sounds super interesting. And uh, like I said, at the time I was in Japan um, and I had just been like very, very into learning like programming languages and like building software on my own. And I was kind of looking for, I mean, I was freelancing as a, as a translator at the time was what I was doing professionally before getting into the apprenticeship. And then that was translating things from what into what? So I was translating documents from Japanese to English. And okay. specifically, it was mainly like, like either technical documents uh, or like legal documents, like contract between businesses and things like that was mainly what I did. Um, but yeah, so I was like really into it. And since I was freelancing, I had a lot of time just to like build out projects in, in, in my downtime. Uh, and I was started looking for jobs professionally in, in Japan, but it was just like, there was nowhere that would even remotely think about hiring somebody who didn't have one, a CS degree, two was not a, like a, a native Japanese speaker, right? Um, so there was like, that was partially a problem as well. Um, and then three, even like the places that I did see where I may thought I maybe had a chance, like the salary was just like half of what I was making as a freelancer and I, it just wouldn't work. Like I couldn't make an end meet like that. So anyway, I found, the, I found the apprenticeship program on Gaslight's website and I went to lunch with my wife uh, who is Japanese. Uh, and then out of nowhere, I'm like, how would you feel about leaving Japan, going to the US <laughs> and while I'm like learning how to become a professional software developer, right? And I thought she was gonna say, no, like this is a crazy idea, but she was just like, oh yeah, no, that sounds really great. Like it showed her Gaslight's website and like mm -hmm. talked about it. You know, like this is what Gaslight does. This is the program that they offer, the apprenticeship program that they offer. And I think it'd be perfect for me. And it also gave me, the ability to like actually make ends meet as I was like going through the apprenticeship program where I wouldn't be like 
completely struggling to like pay my bills and, and just live, live, you know, my daily life. Um, wow. So yeah. I, I, I never knew that it was actually the impetus for you moving. I thought that you had already made plans to do that and you were looking for somewhere to land when you got to the States. Yeah, it was like 100% the impetus to, wow. to move back to the U.S. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, like, that's like one story of how the apprenticeship changed my life is like, I would potentially still be in Japan to this day uh, if I had not, uh, you know, registered and took the, took the test and got, got the interview with, with uh, Chris. Wow. Uh, you've talked about it a couple of times. Um, there, there is a process in the apprenticeship where you take a, uh, a math and logic test is what it's called. Um, what was that like right. for you? I know it's changed over time, but uh, what was your experience in doing that? Yeah, so I think with the, the, there's the, the math and logic uh, test, which I was, when I took it, I was super nervous because uh, I had I'd been like mainly a language person, right? Like I said, I was translating Japanese to English and, and not doing a whole lot of of math or, or logic at the time, aside from what I was doing on like side projects for, uh, for myself as I was like learning, learning how to program. Um, so I was like a little bit nervous about that. Fortunately, like I scored well enough um, and it wasn't like I was, uh, I wasn't like a math major in college either. Uh, I, was, I was an econ major. So anyway, yeah, I, I was a little bit nervous, but fortunately that went well for me. And at the time too, there was, I think there was two requirements. Uh, so like number one is the, the math and logic thing. That was the smaller thing. The bigger thing was uh, you just had to submit a, a project that you had done. And there was like, uh, I think at the time there was like a Twitter clone or something. If you didn't have any ideas, you could build a Twitter clone using whatever and then submit that. And then your, your GitHub repository or however you shared it would be like one of the things that you were evaluated on uh, ahead of time. So. I had several projects that I was working on at the time and like one that I was pretty proud of, I ended up sending over. And I think, I think Chris Nelson liked that one, maybe. Um, I don't know. It was a, it was a, it was a multiplayer Texas Hold'em app. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's exciting. Just because um, it was like, I knew the rules and I could build something based on that. Yeah, Super Chris and well, Chris Nelson, uh, which we who we affectionately call Super Chris, um, over time has been the driver behind the apprenticeship program. And at one point, um, early on, which is when you went through the apprenticeship program, was fairly early on. Uh, he was essentially the sole person, really running the whole program, trying to find the right, uh, trying to find the right opportunities and everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you clearly had an impact on him. Uh, I remember him talking about some of the backgrounds of the people who were going to be in an apprenticeship um, in, in the program. And, and he mentioned that somebody was coming from Japan. And I thought, this is just crazy. Yeah. We're getting somebody from Japan in the apprenticeship program. It was, it was really neat. Yeah, it was really cool. I, like, I remember, I remember being like slightly nervous for the, uh, for the interview because um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. like, I, I really, I really wanted the apprenticeship spot, right? Like I was willing to wait to, if I had to, but I was like, Kind of nervous for it, didn't want to mess anything up. Um, Time-wise, since I was in Japan, my interview ended up being at 11 p.m. my time. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, like, it was like a pairing session with Chris. And so it was like, it was 9 a.m. I think here uh, in Cincinnati. And then it was 11 p.m. where I was. And I was like, all dressed up in my suit, like trying to give a good impression because I was in Japan for too long. And like, that's what you do in Japan to give a good impression is dress up in a suit. So. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was fun. So that was like all the story of how kind of like I built up into the the apprenticeship program. Well, that's exciting. Uh, let's move into the apprenticeship program itself. Uh, what um, what kinds of things uh, impacted you from the apprenticeship experience itself? Like we, you were in the middle of working for a company, getting paid for it professionally. Mm -hmm. um, what were the things that impacted you the most, or that had the greatest effect on you and your development? So I think that there was, there was several things for me. So I, I think I wanna start with number, number one was um, at the time. So my mentor actually was Super Chris uh, at the time. So there's, I think there's several mentors. Um, I ended up with Super Chris and uh, I worked with one other apprentice who like ended up being one of my, my best friends at Gas Lake uh, while I was there um, or, uh, Launched out actually. 
Yeah, Sorry launch scout now. <laughs> launch scout. Uh, so yeah, I ended up working with a, another apprentice, um, Mark, who ended up being one of my best friends while I was working at, uh, at launch scout or Gaslight formerly. And we had regular meetings with Chris. Uh, it was like once a week, sometimes twice a week. Uh, where we did a couple of things. So number one was we had we had like a book club. Um, so there was books that we, Chris kind of assigned us to read. Like we would read a chapter a week or whatever, get together and discuss it. Uh, that was actually super helpful for me because it wasn't just focusing like on hardcore, like programming language, like nuts and bolts, right? It was like mm -hmm. philosophies about programming, like philosophies about working on a larger team with like a, a big software project because if you're, you know, like me and you're just learning how to program on your own before, working on a larger team where there's a bunch of moving pieces is very different than working on a thing on yourself where you can just make changes on your own and push up and not worry about breaking changes or, you know, changing something that somebody else was working on that worked in a specific way and you change it without knowing all the context there. So learning that kind of stuff was super helpful for me, I think, even to this day. Uh, and the other thing is we had, uh, I think, weekly exercises where we would get together and try to like figure out if, like design problems and stuff like this, right? So we started out with kind of like simple algorithm things that turned into, I think it evolved into kind of more complex things. Like how can you, how can you take this one kind of abstract problem and then design it in a better way? So those things I, were really big for me when I was, uh, actually going through the apprenticeship program. And then on top of that, right, just your daily, your daily work. I mean, the very first day of the apprenticeship program, there was a small orientation time uh, at the company that I went to, it was like two hours. And then if we had lunch and then two hours later, I was writing tests for you know, production code. And I just thought that was really cool because I'd never actually done that for anything larger than a personal project before. Oh, wow. It was just a yeah. bunch of code that I had done on my own. I'd never done it on, you know, like an enterprise level thing, but that day, right, the very first day of the apprenticeship program, uh, one of the developers at the, the company I was working at, he was the, the lead engineer on my team that I ended up on. He was like, okay, here's the test. You know, you write the test, I'll write the code, or we'll switch back and forth and that kind of thing. So that was really cool. Wow, that, that is really neat. Um, so when you, when you met with Super Chris, uh, you said weekly or sometimes twice a week. What were the things you talked about? You might have answered that already, but um. yeah, yeah. So, uh, sorry, my <laughs> my other pod died. <laughs> doing the doing the dance of pl unplugging one, unplugging the other one in. <laughs> unplugging one, let it charge for a bit. Um, so we, we talked about we talked about uh, you know several things. We had a. I think the most impactful thing for me was this book club that we had and we had our meetings like once a week, an hour each week that were based around whatever book we were reading at the time. Um, I think one of the first books that we read was called Apprenticeship Patterns. Um, yeah, that, that's so still it, one of the, uh, that, I think that's still the first book that, that people read in the program, both mentors and apprentices. I think that like that was good, just being able to sit down because that book doesn't, like it doesn't talk about the nuts and bolts of programming right it's not like here's how you build a, a linked list or something like that it's it's more like here's how you can work effectively within a team or a larger team and the format that we at least had at the time that I was there was so me and the other apprentice and sometimes we got together with like bigger groups of apprentices that were working in different companies and we would have like open-ended discussions about this kind of stuff plus you know the whole entire time you're working in an actual development team you have real stories about your day-to-day -day work at the time that you could relate to uh, the points that you're kind of learning through the book and stuff like that. So it kind of sounds discuss... like what you're talking about is, is almost like a support group of other people. Um, you know, when you talk about relaying your actual experiences and, and, and tying them back, that's, um, that's not quite curriculum, like, right. It's not like a teacher lecturing and it's not quite yeah. like a computer science program or something like that where you're learning about inverting trees and, and building like lists <laughs> yeah. um so so it, it, but it sounds like it it helped you with like the just the 
the processing of what you were experiencing, you know, taking, accommodating and assimilating new information and new experiences with, with other people. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think that's a, a really good way to put it. It was an hour each week where you had time to, to take a step back, not be heads down by trying to write some code or trying to deliver something or trying to respond to uh, like requests from other teams or anything like that. And actually sit down and think about um, like, number one, how is your apprenticeship grow going? You know, what are you learning on the fly? What are you learning that you couldn't learn in, you know, uh, a textbook or in a computer science class or a, a boot camp? Right? Like, what are some actual lessons that you can actually take away from the day to day professional environment that you're working in? Uh, that was that was one really big thing uh, from from those talks. It's kind of like a support group, like you said. That's really interesting as you as you describe this more and the experience that you had. I can actually see where, even though I didn't go through an apprenticeship program myself, um, I think some of my development as a software developer on a team trying to produce code that went to production was hindered by my inability to understand how real world software projects work. Um, you know, mm -hmm. my background is, is, is a CS degree um, and almost everything that we talked about were algorithmic in, in, in nature or talked about computer programming languages or, you know, different kinds of um, different kinds of data structures, things like that. And we had a couple of projects where we actually had to work together on something and, and build something that was real. But when I, when I hit my first internship or my first co-op out of the program, um, that was when I started to recognize, you know, there was so much I didn't know about the software industry and as a co-op, they put me yeah. on a lot of individual kind of contributor assignments. They'd say, go and learn about this thing and go build this thing. And um, I didn't have a whole lot of collaborative experience until my last co-op. And I, you know, I, I think I was probably about 18 months out of school and into the working world when I actually finally got to the point where I would say most of our apprentices that go through the pro program are, you know, a few months out of it, <laughs> yeah. which is a little bit frustrating for me, honestly, to see such awesome pro progress and, and, and see progression of people through their careers and recognize that, you know, I have some things background wise that, that I've learned um, that don't, you know, that, that apprentices don't necessarily get in a six month program, but to see the productivity and, and the effectivity of people on teams so quickly is is both awe-inspiring. I feel really uh, fortunate to be able to be part of, of the program and, mm -hmm. and helping other people get there. I'm also a little frustrated that I didn't have the same experience myself. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because um, I mean, like the, the things that you said, like those are all important, obviously. I mean, like having an understanding of some algorithms and how they work and data structures and how they work, like that's that's going to be important as a, as a developer, um, to any developer. But there's a, there's a lot more that goes into delivering software than just those those two things. Yeah, that's true. I think I could count, well, at this point, it's a little bit more than one hand, but uh, there, the, the experiences where I've had to use something like a merge sort or, or really think about mm -hmm. performance and think about recursion and really understand the performance characteristics of something so that I could improve it, that happens so less, so much less frequently than interpersonal issues on a project or seeing a team that, that needs to sit back and really have a retrospective and understand what it is that could go better for them as, as, as a team. And, and seeing the apprentices mm -hmm. on projects get to experience that firsthand and get to see these, these healthy retrospectives and these healthy kind of daily standups and talking through um, you know, what, what the work in progress is and, and um, collaborate on those things. It's, it's, really, it's really awesome to be able to see people get that experience because that happens so much more mm -hmm. often. Those, those kinds of issues come up so much more often in a software developer's career than the need to mitigate a specific performance problem in production with a, with a very specific esoteric kind right. of edge case algorithm that you need to know <laughs> or, right. or you know, they're just the right data structure for that particular thing. You can get pretty far with code that doesn't perform well. You can't get very far on a team that doesn't perform well. Um, right. Right. So it's really interesting. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, sure. Past the apprenticeship, um, 
you actually, because of the apprenticeship and some of the, th the circumstances around it, you actually got hired on by Gaslight, which is, is now Launch Scout. Um, and I got a chance to be, uh, I, I, got a, I got a chance to have one-on-ones with you on a regular basis. Uh -huh. So it yeah. was really exciting for me to see some of the things that you grew in and some of the things that excited you and you were passionate about. And I'm excited about this part the most, I think, because you get to, I, I get to see you share your passion of, of the things that, that happened since then. Um, but just talk about that a little bit. What are the things that excited you the most after apprenticeship about software development, your contributions to it? Um, and what are some of the experiences that you've had? Yeah, yeah. So like you said, I mean, um, when I got the, the offer to, to work um, full time with you all, uh, after the apprenticeship program, that was one of the most one of the most ecstatic moments of my life. I was going crazy. I didn't show it, I think, at the office, but like that night when I called when I called my wife, I was like, "Hey, big news, right? I got <laughs> I got an offer, not uh, not with where I thought I was going to end up, but with with a uh, launch cow, formerly Gaslight. So that, that was super exciting. Um, but yeah, after after that, so. Um, like I said, I mean, I was just all this whole entire time, even before I started the apprenticeship program, I just like, for whatever reason, I just found building, building like your own projects or tools or whatever, using programming languages or whatever, like whatever you're into, like super fascinating. So I was just, I was just like really into it and having a good time with it. I, I built my own tools and like had, had fun, like building games and stuff like that. Um, so I, anyway, I got really into functional programming languages, as you know, like I was big into, I've always been big into Elixir. That was kind of like what hooked me into the whole uh, world. That's actually how I found the apprenticeship was because I was in Elixir and I was looking for Elixir-based material. And, uh, you know, like I said, Chris Nelson had a good, a good blog post uh, on something specifically that I was looking at. So I, I just, I kept with it. So even after the apprenticeship program finished, uh, even though like the day-to-day the -day work that I was doing wasn't, wasn't in Elixir for the most part for the first couple of years, uh, I was still like learning about it, reading about it, uh, talking about it, uh, trying to convince other people that Elixir was really cool and they should take a look at it. These are the reasons why. Um, kept building side projects with it, kept going to, there was like Elixir meetups and stuff like that that happens at the office actually. Mm -hmm. um, just a second, my, my headphones are back. Sorry about that. I have headphone issues because I did not charge, I clearly did not charge my headphones enough uh, last night. Yeah, so I was, going, I was going to these meetups monthly on a monthly basis uh, when I was still in Cincinnati, right? So uh, working with you all. And you would hear people would come in every week and they would just be sharing different things about Elixir. Like, okay, I learned how to do this thing in Elixir or like I started doing, uh, like I connected my nodes and I have like a distributed like Elixir cluster, right? You have distributed virtual machines and they're, they're like virtual machines connected together. I thought that was like so cool to, to hear people talk about that and like think about the different edge cases. I remember there was one specific meetup that we had where somebody built a, it was like a distributed distributed battleship type game. Um, it was super interesting just talking through all the different edge cases that you could have. And part of the things that we did was like we, everybody who was at the meetup would program their own player in battleship that you could connect into the cluster and would run, you know, run its own strategy against uh, another, like an opponent or whatever. Just really, really cool stuff. And uh, I was still kind of early on when I started going to these things. Like I was still, I was still an apprentice. I had just began. And these people who were at the, the meetups, a lot of these folks who were giving talks had been talking or they've been in the software industry for, for you know, a decade or more. And uh, I was kind of in awe at first, but, you know, a few months in, I was like, you know, I, I did a thing that was kind of cool. Uh, I'm going to show it off. And I ended up talking kind of like ad hoc at one of the meetups. And I just, I, I think I kind of just enjoyed that, that experience of like sharing, sharing what I'm learning, sharing what I'm doing, that kind of thing, helping get, a, get the word out. Like, like I said, I was really into Elixir, really liked it, really wanted to share uh, some of the cool things that you could do with it. And I felt like that was a good, that was kind of a good platform um, to, to spread that knowledge and to, to share, to share those kind of things that I was learning. So that eventually evolved over time. So like I kept going to meetups, kept talking, those arranged into more organized things. 
And then eventually I started speaking at, at conferences. I think one of the first conferences that I spoke at was the Momentum Developer Conference in, in, in Cincinnati. And uh, I mean, actually like off the top of my head, I don't even remember what I spoke about, but I think it was something uh, related to Elixir and, and maybe, uh, maybe Elm. I think I was using Elm at the time and was really big on that. Um, but yeah, eventually over the years, I ended up getting, uh, like I got some talks accepted to uh, MPEX, uh, like this national, a regional Elixir conference. I went to, to New York to speak. I went to LA to speak. Uh, I went to San Francisco to speak. Um, and then those things kind of, kind of just fueled the passion a little bit more because you meet all these people from all over the country doing all these different things with uh, the, the tools that you're interested in, the tools that you're really passionate about and like finding people across the country that are, that are into that is really cool. Like it's a it feels it feels like the kind of community that I was looking for, that I was searching for, that I, I, I kind of felt like I was missing for a while. That's really exciting. Um, so you didn't you didn't stick with Launch Scout forever. We, we didn't get to keep you forever, um, and you have moved on. What have you done since uh, since moving on from Launch Scout? Yeah. So since since uh, moving on, this was um, almost a. Uh, wow. It's so coming up on two years now. Uh, so oh, wow. I, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it's already two year, almost two years. So I ended up uh, getting a position uh, at at Cars.com, and so uh, just a little a little background there. So Cars.com has been around since like the, the original dot com bubble. Like they, I think they launched initially in 1999. So clearly they were not they were not using Elixir in 1999 because the language didn't exist. Uh, so they actually had an interesting, like a very interesting uh, transition phase where they went from this close to 20 year old uh, legacy system with a bunch of microservices that were in several different languages. And uh, the CTO at the time just said, you know what, this is not, this is not sustainable. Like we need to, we need to get to a more modern platform. And they ended up going with Elixir and they did a full on rewrite of the entire platform. Wow. From scratch. Uh, they started in, in 2019, I believe. And then um, when I joined in 2020, late 2020, uh, the Elixir platform still had not been launched in production. So there was, there was still it's a quite big a rewrite <laughs> to, to get it ready. Um, but the thing that I found super interesting about it was just like, okay, this is actually like an opportunity to see like Elixir really shine at scale. There's going to be, you know, millions of requests per day. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of like background processing and stuff like that, that, that has to happen, has to happen efficiently. And it just, it felt like the perfect use case for Elixir. And uh, it's, it's kind of what turned me on to, to, to cars at first, uh, the position at cars. And yeah, I'm still, I'm still there today. Um, still super interesting, some of the problems that we see and, and being able to solve them at scale. You're going to be, uh, now th there have been a couple of people from cars that have given talks, I think at conferences, even this year at Impex. Um, you're going to be giving yeah. training on something at ElixirConf, right? Yeah, yeah. So like um, we, we are giving training. So me and, and one of my colleagues, Ethan Gunderson, uh, we are going to be giving a training on instrumenting uh, Elixir applications and so what we mean by that is uh, like one of the, the most important things that we do is we need to know whether or not the, the system is healthy and how do you do that? And, and specifically, how do you do that in Elixir? And how do you do it well, right? Like how do you do it without making your system blow up? How do you not interfere with the actual business things that you're doing and still get insights into whether your system is running healthy, uh, like, are you running out of memory? Are there errors happening? Are things blowing up, right? And how do you triage um, any incidents or problems that pop up in a reasonable uh, in a reasonable period of time? Uh, so we're we're gonna we're gonna talk about kind of how you would do that in a general Elixir application, starting from scratch, like starting. Oh, cool. From nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, if you're like a you know a, a beginner at Elixir, or if you're intermediate, you've never set up a instrumentation in, in your application like that's kind of the target audience that we're looking for is, is those folks okay um switching gears just a little bit what would what's maybe the most 
important thing? Maybe that's not the right way to ask that. Let me think about this for a second. What is, what is one thing that you would like for someone who might be considering bringing on an apprenticeship um, and someone like you, uh, you know, a pair, a pair of people coming on and a mentor, what is something that you would like them to know about either the experience that you had or the impact that it's had for you? Yeah, I think th there's probably a couple things that I, I think are important for you know, people who are considering uh, apprenticeship or bringing on a uh, you know, pair of apprentices with a, with a, a mentor uh, to know about. Um, so number one, uh, I think when you, when you consider bringing on an apprentice, you might be thinking like, okay, well, these, this apprentice, maybe they don't know anything. Like maybe they've never actually developed code. Maybe they don't have any experience delivering or shipping code anywhere. And that's, from my experience, when I was in the apprenticeship program, working with the, all the other apprentices that I knew, not only while I was in the apprenticeship program, but after I graduated from the apprenticeship program and saw other you know, new apprentices come in. Um, I still, to this day, am, am amazed at how fast and effectively they were already able to deliver uh, like quality code, right? Not just like they had shipped something and then didn't know whether or not it worked. It was quality code. It was uh, either vetted or helped with, you know, the, the, the help of a, a mentor. Uh, at the time, so folks who have more experience. I think that's super important to realize. You're not bringing on somebody who has zero knowledge of, of programming at all. Um, you're bringing on people who are super passionate about it. I think that's been true for all the apprentices that I've met. Like, number one, they're passionate about it. And number two, like, they've, they've actually have done either personal projects or they've worked on, on smaller projects uh, over time before they joined the apprenticeship program. So I think that's like a super important thing that I'm not sure everybody everybody realizes when they're they're considering apprentices. Um, so that that's one thing, and then for me too, just personally, um, I think I've been pretty fortunate, you know, to end up where I am right now. Um, I, I feel really fortunate being in the position that I like professionally that I am right now. I don't think I would have had this opportunity had I not gone through apprenticeship. I was completely self-taught. I didn't go through a boot camp. Uh, like I said, I was living in Japan at the time, so there weren't even that many opportunities. Like I couldn't just, I couldn't just, you know, stop my full-time work at the time, go to school to learn, you know, programming, get a CS degree. I couldn't like go back and do that. It just wasn't an option that fit with where I was at in life at the time. Um, and then just because I had this opportunity, I was able to get in the door, right? It was the, the foot in the door that I needed. And now being, being through the door, I, I, I feel like I've, I've been able to deliver to, I, I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but I, I ended up where I am, I think, because I am passionate about what I'm doing and uh, I enjoy what I'm doing and I'm willing to learn and learn more, um, which is, I mean, that's true for every apprentice that, that I met, that I work with. Like, they all know how to learn, which is like super important in this job because 90% of what you do to get better is like, you just have to keep learning. Wow, that's, that's really powerful. All right, I want to end with one one more really really important question. Sure. What was your favorite TV show as a kid? <laughs> favorite TV show as a kid? Oh, uh, so there's there's probably a few there's a few that come to mind, but I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna throw out Scooby Doo. Scooby Doo, what Scooby -Doo. a good one. Why not? Sometimes production bugs look like the unmasking of Scooby Doo, and it's just me. <laughs> like I'm the bug that I created in production. Who wrote this code? Oh, it was me. Oh, great. The Get blame again. Me. Get blame is just like a mirror. I, uh. yeah. <laughs> well, this Zach, is why you should disable Get Blame on your. On can your you editor. do that? I don't know. There's, there's always a way. There's always a way. <laughs> if, if there's not a way in your own editor, the answer, I think, clearly is just build your own editor. Build your own editor. Yep. Without get blame, but only when it points to you. If it's somebody exactly, else, yeah, then it puts it like front and center and flashes it like this person. Yeah. 
<laughs> this is not your fault. Well, Zach, thank you for spending some time with me and, and talking about your experiences with the apprenticeship program and, and some of the impact it's had on you. Um, yeah. I really appreciate you spending time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And like I said, it's always, always good to catch up and, and talk with you too, Tim. <laughs>